Hi, I'm Manuel Leonetti, and I'm a group leader at the Chen Zuckerberg Biohub. And in this lecture, we're going to be talking about systematic approaches to map the architecture of human cells. I really love this painting by David Goodsell. Uh, this is a mycoplasma bacterium. This is one of the simplest unicellular organisms that we know about. This guy is tiny. It's about a third of a micron wide, has about 500 genes. But I just find it fascinating that we understand its architecture so well that an artist like David can actually paint a very realistic representation of it. So essentially, the focus of my research is to be able to generate data and understand a human cell with the same level of detail. Um, now, here's the challenge. A human cell is five orders of magnitude bigger and more complex uh, than, than mycoplasma. Okay. So we still have much to learn about how it is organized. But in the post-genomic era, we have, you know, a great chance, which is that the sequence of, of the genome gives us the list of parts, the list of all the different proteins that make up a human cell. Okay. Now, the problem becomes, can we understand of how these proteins are coming together uh, and essentially, you know, decipher the blueprint of cellular architecture? So today, we're going to be talking about key methods to tackle this very problem. Uh, we're going to take a very protein-centric view of the cell, and we're going to be addressing two main questions. Uh, where are the proteins localized in the cell, um, and how are they all wired together? Okay. And really, my goal here is to give you an overview of the different approaches that have been deployed or could be deployed at genome-wide scale to get the complete map of a human cell. So let's start with localization. Obviously, fluorescence microscopy is the key technique here. And there are two main ways to localize a protein under a fluorescent microscope. Um, immunofluorescence using labeled antibodies or fusing a protein uh, with fluorescent proteins uh, such as GFP. So I think it's fair to say that antibody-based methods uh, uh, are the most advanced. And the best example is the Human Protein Atlas project, which managed to raise polyclonal antibodies against the majority of human proteins. And in a real tour de force experiment, Emma Lundberg and her colleagues uh, have used this collection to map the localization of most proteins in human cell lines. Uh, they classify localization between 30 different cellular structures. Uh, a few of them uh, are shown here. Uh, and they've shown that most proteins localize to multiple structures at the same time. I really think that their website is a mine of information, and I encourage you to have a look at it. Now, antibodies usually require cells to be fixed and frozen in time, which is obviously a limitation. But it has one main advantage, which is that the same sample can be bound with antibodies, imaged, and then these antibodies can be washed away, leaving the sample ready for a next round of imaging. So if we can do this process iteratively, we can localize many proteins in the same sample over and over again. And I really think that these multiplexing approaches are going to become very powerful in the near future. And if you want to see a, a great example from uh, the Pelkman's lab that was published recently, uh, you can check out this paper. Now, again, antibodies cannot capture dynamic information. And this is where protein tags become really interesting, because they allow us to localize proteins in live cells. Uh, and as you can see in this video, it's been taken by Rachel, who is a student visiting my lab, not only are proteins dynamic within cells, but the cells themselves are, are dynamic. So I think it's really important uh, to capture this time information. And the power of fluorescent protein tagging has really been exemplified by the work that's been done in the yeast at Saccharomyces cerevisiae, where many teams, and in particular Aaron O'Shea and Jonathan Weissman, when they were at UCSF, have been able to create a genome-wide collection of, of GFP-tagged yeast lines. So uh, this image is a composite illustration of many different yeast lines. Uh, and by now, the vast majority of the 6,000 or so genes in the budding yeast cerevisiae have been tagged with GFP. And beyond informing about localization, the yeast library has really provided us a ton of information uh, about proteins. It can be used in particular to accurately quantify protein levels um, and understand how the proteome changes across conditions. Okay. Every one of these lines is also essentially a potential reporter for phenotypic screening and so on. So one of the main reasons why, why this work has been done in yeast is because we've had methods for a long time that allow us to rewrite the genome of Cerevisiae fairly simply and introduce these GFP fusions. Now, the big revolution in human cells comes from, you know, the, the, the era of CRISPR methods uh, which were developed uh, a few years ago. Essentially, by cutting the genome, 
uh, at a specific locus, CRISPR allows us to catalyze homologous recombination and insert fluorescent proteins in frame directly into a protein coding gene. And so now we can do the exact same experiments that we're doing in yeast, this time in human cells. And so many projects have started building fluorescent libraries uh, of human cells. Uh, and I think a pioneer in this field is the Allen Institutes of Cell Science. So they are using GFP tagging in stem cells to unveil cellular architecture. They've tagged dozens of targets, and they've used these cell lines together with machine learning uh, to build an integrated model of cellular architecture. And uh, here again, I'm going to encourage you to check out their website for up-to-date information. In a separate project, uh, Jan Ellenberg and his team at EMBL are using the fact that fluorescence gives us very quantitative information about protein levels, and using this, uh, you know, tag cell lines to understand how the cell gets remodeled during cell division, and doing that, again, very precisely and quantitatively, so uh, that we're able to plug in, you know, physical models uh, in this kind of experiments. And uh, in my own lab at the Biohub, we're using a very similar approach. In a project that we call OpenCell, uh, we're actually using a split GFP system to facilitate high-throughput CRISPR uh, tagging. And you can read this paper if you want to know more about this technique. Essentially, that allows us to build uh, libraries of hundreds and, so and soon thousands of human cell lines uh, tag endogenously uh, with fluorescent proteins. So stay tuned. We're approaching the final stages uh, of our first data release. Uh, and I'd be very excited to tell you uh, uh, in the future what we learned from these experiments. So in a nutshell, it's a very exciting time for cell engineering. And I think it's just you know, a question of, of months or years uh, before all of us together will be able to create genome-wide collections of fluorescent cell lines in human cells, just like we had uh, in yeast. So before uh, I finish this part, let me just mention that imaging is not the only method that allows us to profile localization. Uh, spatial proteomics, which is a biochemical method, uh, for example, can localize cells by first isolating different organelles uh, in a cell lysate by ultracentrifugation and identifying proteins in each fraction um, in a very quantitative manner using mass spectrometry. And that allows us to create organelle-level maps of protein localization. And here again is a great paper that you can uh, uh, check out to, to learn more about this. So overall, we have methods today, mostly using imaging, antibodies, and CRISPR cell lines to be able to localize any protein in the human cell. Now, the second step is going to be understanding of how these different building blocks are wired together to get the blueprint uh, of the cell. And the first stage of wiring happens at the level of protein complexes. For example, ATP synthase, which is shown here, uh, which contains more than 20 different polypeptides from eight different subunits. Right? So a lot of these proteins are acting not on their own, but as part of like this kind of big assemblies of protein complexes. Now, to uh, profile protein-protein uh, uh, interactions, uh, the most powerful method by far is immunoprecipitation mass spectrometry, or IP mass spec. So in this method, we're going to take cells, we're going to break them open, and very quickly go fishing for a protein of interest, usually using uh, antibodies, and, and using mass spectrometry to identify which other proteins are coming along for the ride. There are a few large-scale data sets in human cells that are available uh, using this method. And a reference in this field is the Bioplex data set by Steve Gigi, Wed Harper, and their colleagues at Harvard, uh, which have used overexpression of epitoc tag proteins to profile the interactome of tens of thousands of targets. Okay. So this is an image from their first paper, but they've kept building uh, a great resource uh, over the years, um, and uh, all of that data is available online. Now, what I think is really interesting is that it turns out that fluorescent proteins such as GFP are also a formidable handle for immunoprecipitation. Um, that's because we have very good antibodies or nanobodies uh, against GFP. So essentially, we can use the same cells to localize proteins and uh, define their interaction. And this is an approach that, for example, has been used by Matthias Mann, Tony Hyman, Marco Hein, uh, and their colleagues a few years ago to define uh, the interactome of, of over a thousand different proteins with very high precision. And today, uh, my lab is working with Matthias to use the same techniques and profile interactome uh, in our collection of CRISPR GFP cell lines. And finally, beyond profiling just direct interaction, there are methods that are available today to measure proximity of proteins uh, within a cell. And in these methods, uh, many of them were pioneered by Alice Ting uh, and her lab. Instead of 
tagging proteins with fluorescent proteins, um, we can fuse them with chemically active reporters. And under these conditions, um, if, we treat this, if we treat cells with uh, the right molecules, um, these, uh, these, chemical, these chemical reporters become active, which leads to chemical marks being deposited on proteins in the proximity of our target. And because the radius of labeling here is fairly small, just tens of nanometers, uh, that allows us actually to map proximity with fairly high precision. Okay? And we can use mass spec to identify these, uh, these chemical marks. So this is a method that is more recent, but has a lot of potential. Um, and the first large-scale study by uh, Anne-Claude Jean Gras Lab just got uh, published on BioArchive, uh, and they just released the website. So we have a lot of mass spec methods to profile wiring at the level of protein complexes. Um, and now the, the next and the final stage of understanding how a cell is wired is to be able to put you know, all of these functional units back into the context of functional pathways. For example, signaling pathways that shape cellular behavior. And here, the method of choice is going to be to turn genes off or on and measure how the cells react to it. And we can cluster genes based on the similarity of their phenotypes. Okay. Uh, for example, if the loss of, the loss of gene A and the loss of gene B elicit very similar phenotypes, it's going to be likely that these genes are going to be part of the same pathway. Okay. Now, to take this a step further, we can study what's called genetic interactions. So let's assume that the phenotype we're interested in uh, here is cell growth, just to keep things simple. Okay. We can take cells, we can turn off gene A, measure its phenotype. We can turn off gene B, measure its phenotype on its own. Okay, and then we can turn off both genes in the same cell at the same time. If the two genes are not interacting, we're going to expect that, you know, the growth rate of this cell is essentially going to be the product of the two individual phenotypes. Now, things start getting interesting when the measurement deviates from this prediction. For example, um, the double mutant can be actually doing better than what we expect. Okay, this is often the case when A and B are actually part of the same linear pathway. And the idea here is, you know, it's the pathway that the cell is caring about. So, you know, if we turn off A, then there is not much of an additional phenotype to turn off B at the same time because the pathway is already there. Okay. So, uh, conversely, the double mutant can be actually doing far worse than what we expect. Okay. And that usually tells us that A um, and B are acting into two parallel pathways that are important for the same response. So that the cell can cope with the loss of uh, one of these branches, uh, but if both of them are turned off at the same time, the cell uh, uh, really cannot, uh, cannot, cannot cope anymore. Okay. So these are very simplified examples, but it gives you kind of the idea of how genetic interactions are very powerful at very precisely mapping functional pathways. And again, one of the best examples uh, uh, illustrating the power of, of these approaches comes from the yeast uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, especially the seminal work of Charlie Boone, uh, Brenda Andrews, and their colleagues in Toronto, which have been able to map using extremely large collection of double mutants uh, every or close to every pairwise combination uh, of genetic interaction in the yeast. And they've used this information to show how powerful genetic interactions can be at grouping proteins that belong to the same functional units. Okay. And you can check uh, one of their recent papers, uh, and especially one of their recent reviews, uh, to learn more about how genetic interactions are a powerful way uh, to understand pathways. So um, here again, the reason why yeast has been so powerful is that we know how to turn genes off or on. Uh, in serious VCA, we've been able to do this uh, for a long time. In human cell, the CRISPR revolution has also transformed our ability to do that recently. Okay. And especially, uh, we now have tools called CRISPR-I for inactivation or CRISPR-A for activation that allow us to very specifically turn genes on or off uh, in human cells. And most of these tools rely um, on a catalytically inactive version of the Cas9 protein um, that essentially acts as a protein platform to recruit transcriptional repressors uh, or transcriptional activators to a gene of interest to turn it uh, off or to turn it on. And a lot of this work has been developed in Jonathan Weitzman's lab, Tan Li Shi, and Lou Gilbert uh, at UCSF. Okay. So these methods are extremely powerful and very easy to scale. And so the first studies are coming out that allow us to do very large uh, uh, data set of functional genomics in human cells. And at the same time, our ability to measure a very complex phenotype, high-dimensional phenotypes, 
is rapidly increasing. And the rule of thumb here is that the deeper the phenotype we can measure, the more specific the clustering approach uh, uh, to identify genes that, that belong to the same pathway become. Okay. So there's a lot of interest in using the transcriptome of perturbed cells uh, as a very high dimensional phenotype. And there are methods that exist today that can couple CRISPR-based perturbation and single-cell RNA-seq to read perturbation and transcriptome uh, in the same very high throughput experiment. And if you want to learn more about how these kind of approaches are very useful, especially in the context of genetic interactions, uh, here's a recent paper that, uh, that, that, that you can read. And uh, finally, there are image-based methods uh, that allow us to also get very high dimensional information about cell state. I'm going to call that measuring cell morphology. Okay. We can use uh, multiplex labeling approaches, such as what we discussed a few slides ago, uh, but also label-free imaging, for example, bright field or phase, uh, or phase imaging, to get you know, a fairly comprehensive view of how a cell looks like and use machine learning to interpret what that tells us about the state of a cell and transform that into a high-dimensional phenotype. So now we have uh, these methods that are kind of falling together that allow us, for the first time, to do these very large-scale perturbation studies uh, in human cells as well. Okay? So I'm going to leave you on this. And uh, I think I've shown you that we have now methods to study protein localization, or molecular interactions, and mapping functional pathways with unprecedented, unprecedented scale uh, and precision. So the next challenge is going to be able to bring all of these different approaches together to get the complete wiring diagram uh, of a human cell. And I think it's a very exciting time for cell biology, and I can't wait to see uh, the next generation of studies. Um, let me finish by uh, thanking my lab and my collaborators at the Biohub and beyond, and thank you for watching.